right, everybody, we are live. Y'all should be able to hear me. I hope so. I spent an entire 30 minutes putting this layout together, so if it's bad, you can definitely blame me for procrastinating. But welcome in, everybody, <laughs> to episode one of the Commentator Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Nine Whole Grains. Vicky Kitty is our illustrious guest today, and uh, I know I've thanked you already here in the pregame, but thank you so much for doing this, Vicky. It means a lot. Absolutely. I love talking about commentary. I was talking to you about it earlier today, but I could talk about this for hours on end. Well, we'll see if it goes hours, minutes, whatever we get out of this. It's going to be a pretty freeform discussion. And to kind of go into a little bit of background on what exactly this is supposed to be and why I wanted to do it, the, the commentator speaker series is sort of my attempt to help people who are newer at commentary improve because I get a lot of questions about... I would say just where do I start? Splatoon 3 is, of course, on the horizon. Not close enough, but it's still on the horizon. And people ask me, Nine, how did you get into commentary? How do you go about improving at it? What is this craft even about? And it's hard when I still feel like I'm learning it to really answer those questions. However, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of really famous people who are really good at commentary. So I'm onloading the work onto them so that they can teach you uh, while I come <laughs> along for the ride and learn a little bit as well. So that's the main idea behind the Commentator Speaker Series. I hope you all are enjoying it. I don't know how many episodes there are going to be. I'm still talking to some of my old friends to see if I can get them on. Uh, but I hope you all enjoy it, and um, I think we're going to have a great time and a great conversation here. So, Vicky, um, I was trying my very best to put together this, like, CVS pharmacy list of all the <laughs> accolades you have, and I just couldn't. So what I'm going to do instead is toss it over to you, inform the good people of your journey, what all you've commentated, and we'll kind of start our conversation from there. Gotcha. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm Vicky Kitty, and I'm a commentator for the Overwatch League Apex Legends Global Series uh, tournaments, as well as the Smash Brothers tournaments that I get to attend here and there whenever they manage to host them. I know we've been kind of on, on having some downtime, so I've been trying to figure out um, when these events are going to be coming back, and slowly but surely they have been. So it's been nice to actually manage my way back into the Smash community. But I've been juggling those three games for quite some time now, and I love it. I can't, I can't cast games that I don't play, and that's why it's like my number one rule when it comes to going into casting the games that I love. I, I We're going to go ahead and start on that because you the, the thing I've always been most impressed about, the mm -hmm. way that you commentate, is the games that you commentate aren't necessarily the same types of games. Like I know that two of your games do involve shooting a gun at other people, but Apex <laughs> and Overwatch are very different, and of course Smash yeah. Bros. couldn't be any more different. So... Let's just kind of start with, like, first of all, I guess, what attracted you to commentating all of these different games? And from there, we'll kind of go into how you went about learning them, because there's some things that can't really transfer between the three titles. Yeah, so because I have to play the games that I think about casting in the future, I actually was playing Overwatch for four and a half years every single day. It, it, it was crazy because I obviously was casting Smash at the time. But to me, playing Smash was going to Smash Local, Smash Fest, um, and having a lot of fun at the national level events that I could play with other players that I don't get to get the same matchup practice. So then when I was home and by myself, I wouldn't play Smash like that unless I was trying to train for some tech that I wanted to really like nail down the timing for. I actually only ever played Overwatch. And I loved Overwatch. I, I still love Overwatch. Overwatch 2 is on the horizon. I'm playing Overwatch 2 beta, and it is so fun. I definitely see this game that has a lot of potential. Um, and when it came to casting Overwatch, I actually, in 2017, had the opportunity of going to Taiwan to cast an Overwatch side event called the Overwatch Hero Rumble. And I actually got to cast that event with Osti, who is a uh, Smash Brothers commentator as well, as a Splatoon commentator. And it was very different, and I wasn't used to the, the production level and the studio that was provided to us. It was just a completely different world. I mean, when you come from Smash Brothers and then yeah, you get oh to see God. this gigantic, not only the stage, but then the studio. I got hair and makeup done. I was like, where am I? This is just like a whole different world. Like, are we, are we, is this the same industry? Like, and it's also very humbling, though, because you get to see how a lot of these events, um, they transpire and you realize like wow you know we really were molded through the fire and flames but i love that i love that about smash and, and that's why it feels like home because no other community really brings that grassroots feel into their own esport and then from 
playing Overwatch so much into getting invited to cast Overwatch contenders, that was my connection from doing the 2017 event where they really wanted a different variety of casters who just had not been able to experience Overwatch commentary to that level because it was a fun event. It was it wasn't supposed to be Overwatch League status. It wasn't even tier three with Collegiate. It was supposed to be a fun event, and I had a lot of fun because in my in my head I'm like, man, this is the game that I play so much of, and I'm seeing like these big mass mascots so many amazing cosplayers it was just completely different energy and then i started focusing more on smash then smash ultimate came out and i needed to put more attention and time into my notes and into the players and new players coming into the scene and then in 2019 at the end of 2019 right before the big 2020 happened mm -hmm. uh i was actually asked to cast overwatch contenders and to live half the year in germany while doing tier two i was so psyched i i was it was beyond me. In my mind, actually, I told myself that, man, I'm going to only go to the United States to cast Smash tournaments. I had already my flights booked to go to, I believe it was Full Bloom at the time. So I had my flight set up to go to Germany and then from Germany go to Full Bloom. And then that was kind of going to be my cycle between doing Smash events in the U.S. and then staying in Germany to finish the contender season. Then 2020 happened and then all my cast became remote. And from there, I still kept playing Overwatch. I still played Smash, uh, but then eventually transferred over to trying out a game that I've never played before, which was Apex Legends. I fell in love with that game immediately. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but and I know this is going to sound so weird, but Apex to me is like a fighting game shooter. And the way, the reason why I could explain it like that is it's not just the abilities, it's there's movement tech to it that I love. That, that has to be the highlight to everything in Apex is the way that the movement works. There's movement tech and there's so much micromanaging and micro decisions that you have to make in that game that is so important. And I became the IGL, which is considered the in-game leader of my group. And I made a lot of friends playing the game. So then I started playing from Overwatch to playing Apex every single day throughout the entirety of the pandemic. And within a year and a half, I I told myself, you know, I feel like I'm confident enough with my shot calls. I'm confident enough talking about the game to try my hand in casting it. And the first day that I casted that event, I immediately was like, I understand the pacing to this. It's, it was literally a pacing of Overwatch and Smash put together in my mind, <laughs> which how convenient is this? Right, right. So <laughs> I, I, it's like, I, it was insane to me and I loved it. And to this day, I always tell myself, man, if I cast a game, I need to put in, like, at least for myself, just for my own confidence, a year's worth of, like, hardcore tryharding oh. before I feel comfortable enough to, like, sit behind the mic and then give my analysis and what I think is good, what I think is bad, why this play is hype and why it's not. You hit on a really interesting point there of the pacing of the two games coming together for Apex because mm -hmm. when I, so I started commentary with Super Smash Brothers Melee talking about Smash and locals, like, you have one mic that you're passing back and forth between you and your pal, and you're working off a dazzle for your capture card, and everybody can hear you. The, the players can hear you. Anyone who says some random curse word in the back comes over the mic. Like, that's the place <laughs> where we all started. But, you know, the, the thing that stunned me the most when I moved over to Splatoon from Smash is, like you said, the pacing there. Because there's, of course, eight players as opposed to two on the screen, and you had to have kind of like a more holistic understanding of what was going on everywhere at the map. And that was not easy in Splatoon 1 because you only had one cam. You didn't have the full, mm -hmm. like, spectator. So, funny enough, when I was learning how to get, I, I would say get more comfortable in commentating Splatoon, I actually studied hockey, which people always say, why oh. hockey? But you got to understand hockey is a sport that doesn't really have traditional timeouts. I mean, if the putt goes out of play or the glass breaks, then you can kind of do it. But you'd be amazed at how many ways those commentators can say, pass the puck and make it sound cool. Slides the biscuit, <laughs> dishes the dish. Like, there's so many ways to do it. <laughs> And so that, but I didn't realize until later that it worked because of the pacing, because again, there's so many things they have to be commentating and taking stock of. If all they do is keep up with the puck, you're one, not going to be very good at it because the puck moves way too fast, but also you just, you can't possibly keep up with everything that's going on if you're mm -hmm. just focused on the center of attention, if you will. So the, talk a little bit about like going strictly from Smash Bros to Overwatch, because that, if, if Apex is yeah. the middle of the two, that means those two had to be pretty far apart. Obviously, you were comfortable with Overwatch because you were playing it, as you admitted, every day. 
you know, what, like, what were the big challenges going between those two? Because I can't imagine there was as much carryover as you might think. I, I don't know if this is like a common thing that, that casters, I guess, in the, in the industry and other games think. But in my opinion, I felt like going from Smash to casting Overwatch was extremely hard. Like, there was a completely different pacing compared to what we're used to in Smash. Because in Smash, there is no strict play-by-play -play in color. In Overwatch, you are hired strictly based off of what role as a caster you are. So I had to understand... The first question that was asked to me was, are you color or are you play by play? Hmm. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I had no idea because I loved analysis in Smash Brothers. I loved talking about why certain things happened. But I also, at the same time, if I was too long in an explanation in Smash and something important happened immediately, instead of passing it, I immediately was like, oh my god. And then he gets the ledge trump and then he gets the back air. And that's actually the reason why he manages to get that stock. Amazing timing with that ledge trump. And... Going in from analysis into play play like that, it allows you to immediately reset because the stock going away is a heavy reset right there that you could mm -hmm. just soft toss to your co-caster. I never thought about it so deep in Smash commentary because that was the first game that I started with, and I was never sat down and was, hey, hey this is how a constructive or constructed commentary works in Smash. This is what we need to do. This is how it works. None of that. It was like... We went to our locals, we cast and smash, mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun. There was trash talk, like you were mm -hmm. saying in the background that the mics would pick up. I love that energy because I'm I'm a goblin. I love feeding into the <laughs> trash talk. I would absolutely say, Yeah, talk to him in the back when I'm like on the mic, it's like you know, you don't really get that sort of energy in Overwatch where you can be funny, you can put in some trash talk, but you don't ever want to put down a player because it's not it's not that grassroots feel and also mm -hmm. it's like these players this is their career they're they're yes, part of a, exactly. an organization they're part of a team this is their job it's like imagine somebody outrightly saying on the mic like that guy sucks at his job like in that one play it's like damn man it's a little harsh <laughs> and uh, it smashes completely different that's that energy is just mm -hmm. they're out there and i love that that's that's what i really like about that type of community but when it came to getting used to the pacing i had to figure out does do i feel like I'm suited better for play by play or color in Overwatch. And in the moment that I was thinking about it, I felt like talking about the insane team fights in Overwatch in a 6v6 format was really fun for me because I could highlight what is the most important thing out of all the 12 players that you see on the screen? Mm -hmm. The Ana has ult. There's a Genji on their team. The Genji has ult. You know that immediately they're going to combo into Nanoblade because that's the play that they're looking for. That's why they're running this team comp. Uh, you look at the enemy team. You look at the composition that they're running. You look at uh, Winston. You look at Tracer. You look at Lucio. You immediately know they're running dive. So what's their end goal? You know that as a play-by-play -play caster, you're going to wait for the Lucio to speed boost the entire team close together mm -hmm. and wherever the Winston goes the tracer should follow so then you you immediately start nitpicking parts of the fight that you need to prioritize not only based on the economy of the ultimates that the players have but also the team compositions and because I genuinely love the game I love being able to just talk about that on the mic about how this is going to happen, why it's going to happen, and depending on the players playing on the screen, how it's going to be executed amazingly. And then when you see creative plays, then you go absolutely crazy, and then your voice and your energy carries over, and, and it, it's just a different feel to it. And I got genuinely excited like that, casting play-by-play -play moments in Smash 2, but because there is no fluid back and forth of color and play-by-play -play in Smash, it's kind of like what you would call casting synergy. That's the best way I would mm -hmm. put it. It's like, if you know that you have really good synergy with a co-caster, it's because you could flow in a conversation with them because it wasn't, hey, there's back and forth happening. As play-by-play, play, I'm going to take this back and forth because then the color caster has to spend a minute maybe after this whole back and forth was happening explaining why this back and forth was happening, which by that point, there's already something else happening in Smash Brothers. Exactly. So the pacing was all off. So then when it came from doing that, doing understanding Overwatch, color play by play i did strictly play by play for overwatch got the hand of overwatch and i i went through training i i actually would reach out to multiple casters from the overwatch league status i reached out to the contenders casters we reached out to the crew for overwatch league and overwatch league also has an amazing system in allowing their casters to grow when we were doing overwatch contenders for my first year overwatch league partnered up with overwatch contenders with like the heads of each talent group mm -hmm. and so overwatch league would have an overwatch league caster 
characters sit down with a duo in Overwatch, they're, they're, it's static duos for the most part. Usually, you get paired with a co-caster. Chances are you're not separated from that co-caster unless there's one opportunity that one caster takes over the other, and then unfortunately, the duo is split up. Um, but usually, you stick with that co-caster throughout the entire season. You do not wander off of that co-caster unless you're filling in for another caster. And so, within the first two months, Overwatch League had established a connection with the Overwatch Contenders Talent Group, and they brought an Overwatch League top commentators. It was different casters, too, that actually opted to, to help the casters in, in Overwatch Contenders. And they sat down with a duo, and they would VOD review. And they would talk about wow. why this was great, why why this needs work, um, how this could have been said differently. And my mind was blown. I was, I was seeing things in a different way where I was able to get input from Matt Morello, I was able to hear things from award-winning Uber, Mitch, who is insane, like one of the best play-by-play -play casters that I have ever had the luxury of just hearing him just shout all this crazy stuff. And it's so great to hear the reason and the flow as to how they do things, because then it puts into perspective, what can I work on better? What crutch words do I have? Why do I say them? Um, how do I introduce players differently? What, what, what? How do I expand my vocabulary that doesn't that doesn't come from just me reading a book and picking up on new phrases and new words that I like to do? Because that's that's how I used to pick up on new phrases was by from reading, just literally reading. And then the Apex came around, and it's funny because even though I'm playing play an Overwatch, I'm actually uh, put onto color on Apex. So I've had to figure out the different roles that both games provide, even though it's different pacing, but then it's kind of very similar when it comes to the toss, because at the end of the day, the toss from color to play to play, it's, hey, this fight is done, you take the toss, and you kind of sum up the fight without having to say too much, because then now right. you're talking into your co-caster's time, that that's their time to shine. And so from doing play by play in Overwatch League and learning when a fight is done because everything has already, already been utilized. There's already, your supports are already dead. You could start wrapping up this fight unless a miracle happens. And in that case, there's situations. It's like the color caster takes it, sees that something's about to happen, that this player's about to clutch, tosses it back to play by play, and then we, I take it again. So it'd be like that back and forth in that brief moment. In Apex, it was very similar where a lot of those insane play by play fights happened mostly in the end game. Why? Because that's when everybody is close together. It's a final circle you got three gibby domes down on the field you got people just dancing around each dome very similarly to what you see with winston bubble and how a lot of dps play around the edge of the winston bubble and then i was able to take that pacing while taking the fact that i'm on color for apex and then use what i knew about apex about rotations teams compositions what the goal is for those compositions if these teams are going to rat it up and go for end circle positioning and not move anywhere and then use what i knew from that and then applied it onto commentary so it was a lot of being diverse and being flexible between doing the back and forth that smash brothers provides the play by play that overwatch gave me and then the color commentary which is the analysis portion of apex legends there's so much gold and i think just the answer that you gave there that i had like six like mental points that i wanted to build off of and now like it's amazing how it feels like you and i speak the language on the same language rather on so much of this because your point about everything with the Lucio and the dive comp, and you start to pick up on, for this big push to happen, this is the first domino that falls. That, I think, kind of in, like, maybe my second year of commentating Splatoon, that's when that whole concept really started to fall into place for me, is especially in Splatoon 2, so much of it is set play, where a team will build two specials, and you start to see if all these boxes get checked, this happens. And you can start to find ways to succinctly set that up for the audience, where you say okay, if the Ultra Stamp is out here on the right side of the map and it leads the charge with the Tentabrella behind it, the Rainmaker push gets the lead. Like, that's it. That's all you have to say. And then if something goes awry in that plan, then you get crazy hyped because you're like, whoa, this thing that I just set up for the audience didn't happen. Now the audience is excited in addition mm -hmm. to you. And it's all because you set up that, that signpost. And as you see more and more of these games, you start to, I think, pick up on those earlier and earlier because... You know, kind of like with, with hockey and what you were saying, too, with Overwatch, there's so much going on. You can't possibly inform the audience at all, or you're going to sound like you were in an auction or something along those lines. You just can't <laughs> yeah. possibly do it. So I, I think that is such a great point for anyone who's still a little bit newer to the craft. Like, that is the advantage you get from watching and commentating so many games is 
you you will still get nervous, but you will start to understand what scenarios are coming up earlier. And because of that, you can set it up for the audience. And the easier you can make it for the audience to figure out when a big play is made, that's when you get real mastery over the craft, I feel like. When you make the audience understand why a play was big before it even happens, that, ugh, I, when, whenever I, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, whenever I commentate on something big for Nintendo, or there's a general audience of, of non-gamers, when they say, hey, you made me understand what was going on, that's just like, oh, my heart, that's the biggest praise that I can get. My girlfriend's uh, father, you know, in his 50s, never played a video game in his life, and he says, well, I still don't know what an inkling is, but I sure understood what was going on, and that may be buttering <laughs> me up, but it's... It's part of it too. And another great point that you kind of made there, and this isn't a topic that I put on our list, but I should I should have, is this idea of play-by-play -play analyst and the idea of roles in commentary. Because mm -hmm. you're entirely right. In Smash, it's, it's back and forth, right? If you can't pass the ball and pass different comments and analysis back and forth in Smash, it's going to sound very awkward because there's not – there's not time for like a traditional thing. If you're talking play by play, an entire stock got taken. There were ten little micro interactions in that yep. bit that like you have to be able to speak to and then pass midway through. And I think that a similar thing happens in Splatoon because in Splatoon there typically isn't a true setup period like there is in some of these other games. It's it's four v four. Everyone's responding very quickly. It, it's a fast paced game and it's made to be. So that is, I think, kind of a, a great. God, you can do an entire episode on that. A great discussion to talk about when it's best to go back to the, I guess, the the duo rather than a true role. But, I mean, is, mm -hmm. there, is there a preference that you have? Do you like one of those arrangements a little bit more than the other? I Honestly, it's going to sound dorky, but I think I just – I think because of my experience in Smash, I just love it all. Like, I, I love doing both. Um, I If I could say a preference and either or, I – don't think I would be able to really bring the hype doing color casting in Overwatch like I can in play by play. So I would prefer to still do play by play in Overwatch. If if they were like, hey, we want you to do color, I don't know how I would feel about that because I prefer doing the play by play moments. I like doing exactly what you were mentioning before. Being able to highlight a very intense moment and then hearing your voice through the highlight reels because it's so crazy and then you just go absolutely wild and you know that the crowd's going to go wild with you even when we're in a remote setting, which is also really important because usually at these tournaments, there's a whole stadium behind you. The crowd going crazy is picked up on the mic and you could feel the energy just transpire through just the online version of what you're watching into people watching at home, into the crowd behind you, and... Being able to bring that hype is what I really like as a caster. I could do that in Smash. I could I, I mix a little bit of that in color in Apex because in Apex, while you're building things up, yeah, you talk about the rotations. You talk about there's 20 teams, 20 teams, 60 players, all of them doing their own thing at the start of the game. They're picking up their loot, and then you already know what their end goal is just depending on the team comp they're, they're run, that they're running. In that portion of the game, it's not like the color caster is talking the entire time until eventually a team runs into each other in a gigantic map. And it's not like that. It's actually very Smash uh, Smash Brothers commentary where you're going back and forth. The color is setting up the analysis portion of what teams are watching, what teams are about to run into each other depending on where they land. And then because you don't want to be talking for two minutes straight, mm -hmm. you'll have it, you'll toss it to your co-caster and your co-caster will start talking about the teams as well. They won't do as hard of, as a heavy analysis, but then when they toss it back to you and you see a fight, I immediately say something short and then toss it back to them and they'll take over the play-by-play -play portion. And it gets really exciting because then they'll sum it up and then I get to say why everything just happened in front of us, very similarly to why Color would sum up the Overwatch fights that we see in a team fight. Cool dude actually in the chat asked a really good question here, which is which of those arrangements do I think works best for Splatoon? And I I do I, I kind of alluded this to this a moment ago, but I think that the Smash approach is almost necessary. And I, I've held this opinion for a long time in Splatoon because again, like you said, Vicky, if you just comment on all of the big things happening in Smash, you're gonna be talking by yourself for four minutes and your yeah. partner's gonna go up and leave and they're gonna be angry at you. You don't want that. But <laughs> I, I think that you will certainly have strengths as a caster. And I think that when people start off their casting journey, they will sort of fall into a pass the ball to me for an analytical portion versus I've got a great, warm, exciting voice and I can bring hype to even a main play. I think that 
people do typically fall into one of those two just because of sheer comfort level. But I think to be a truly complete broadcast, you, you have to have the versatility that Vicky is kind of alluding to here because you're going to get matched up with different people. And especially in a mm -hmm. non-structured setting like Splatoon where the caster pairing is whoever decided to show up that day, you're going to need to find a way to play around different aspects of it. And frankly, I think that most people who are really into the game can do that. We all have a great knowledge of this game. We've been playing it for five years. We know what's going on. We haven't had a pat we haven't had a, a major balance patch in over a year. Like we know what's about to happen in these games. So I, I think that you need to have a little bit of both, but more than anything, you need to have good chemistry with your partner and be willing to uh, to, to pass it back and forth. Um, yeah. I, I will, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No worries. I actually, something that you just said reminded me of something important. The reason why I, I actually felt like I was able to be flexible from play to play to color is exactly what you were saying is knowing that you have to be flexible with your co-caster and being okay with being hybrid because because you don't know who your co-caster is going to be for a lot of these events, especially when you're starting up as a caster. You don't know who your co-caster yeah. is for a lot of these events because they're not they're not given to you as like, hey, do you have a preference over the casters that you want to cast with? At least starting out, no, you don't because oh. you don't know who your co-casters are in the community so when i was first casting smash and i was on the mic with whoever whether it be local talent major talent national level talent celebrity talent because you know we've had alpha rat on the on the couch during mm -hmm. summit at one point we had asa butterfield there and so even though you don't know how they are as a caster, you just need to know how to flow well. Pick yes. up the way that they speak. Do they like talking a lot? Do they like talking about the game a lot? Do they like to only highlight the crazy hype moments? And then from there, you could be flexible as a caster to work around them, to compliment them. And it's not that you have to fit into every shoe, but it just sounds really good for both of you at the end when you manage to work together and you have that really good synergy. Um, I, I'll, I'll pass it here to the next uh, topic that we had because you kind of alluded to it, but I'll just note that our big celebrity that we had come and cast with us was uh, Failboat, if you're familiar with him. Kind of same like commentary, or not commentary, content creation sphere is uh, Alpha Rad, mm -hmm. not quite as big. I think he recently passed a million, so go Failboat. But oh, he, nice. he could make any play seem exciting just through sheer energy. But I remember talking to him after one of the first casts, and he was like, this moves really fast, man. And I was like, hey, if anything seems complicated, pass it to me. And then when we get to the big play, I'll get out of the way and you do your thing. So, yeah, comfort and confidence will come with time. But you mentioned the difference between in-person and online. Because, mm. obviously, with uh, 2020, there were a lot of events, pretty much every event for at least a good year and a half, that would have been in person that either got canceled or had to go back into an online sphere. Um, in the world of Splatoon, we were like, okay, this is business as usual. Most of our casts were online, but I remember seeing you know, uh, TK Breezy and you and a number of casters talk about how difficult that transition was. So um, you know, talk a little bit about maybe some things that you learned along that path of like, okay, how do I take what used to be a stadium full of people, this energy, how do I add that in without it feeling cheap? What's crazy is that now that I'm so used to casting remotely, I don't want to say I prefer it because I, I love the energy of a crowd and also seeing friends that I haven't seen mm -hmm. in forever. That's probably what carries it the most, honestly, seeing For my sure. friends that I haven't been able to see in a long time. Um, and, and that's why I love going to Smash events that my friends are currently at. But when it was starting out with the transition was so hard because I had a very scuffed setup. I didn't know <laughs> how I was going to have the space to do this. And I... <laughs> I had my, just to put it into perspective, my webcam was attached to the top of my monitor with sticky tack. And then when I got a DSLR camera for the equipment portion of Overwatch, I had no way to attach an arm or anything to my desk because the structure of my desk was very thick and I had a backboard. So there was no, no clamps, nothing like that could could work on my desk i would have either needed a mount with a base or and then even with the base i wouldn't have had space because then the desk is very small right so i then got duct tape to duct tape to tlr <laughs> to the headboard of the the setup so it was extremely scuffed i felt like how am i gonna do this i have no lights i i <laughs> I share a room with my younger sister. We had bunk beds and everything. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. Eventually, different production teams, they worked with me. They worked with my space, with pictures, with videos, and gruesome times. Um, they, with what it was like six hours set up at one point, 
helped me set up everything to allow it to fit, to allow it to work. And even if it looked ugly, it still worked. And and that made me uncomfortable and just sitting down and having a green screen literally attached to my back type of thing mm-hmm. where I couldn't move my chair to go <laughs> to the bathroom. I had to shimmy shade my way to a side to then run to, across my green screen then to go to the bathroom. So remote setups were really hard for me. It's a lot easier now, thank goodness. I, I now have my own place and I got a bigger desk and it's it's a, a completely different experience. But starting out was really difficult, not only because I had to cast without having my co-caster physically with me, which mm-hmm. for casters that know casting remotely, how do you know when to take a throw if it isn't the intonation of a voice, you know? In, I just came back from Sweden a week ago, and I casted the, the first LGS land that has happened since, what, 950-plus days since the very first Apex Legends land? Apex, unfortunately, was just esports started off for them in the worst time possible mm-hmm. because that's when 2020 immediately yeah. hit and doing the apex land when fall and i were casting every time he had a point put up a fist every time i had a point i'd put up a fist and we would get super hype and the back and forth was so easy because we, he would say something super hype and i'll pick it up in the same tone and that was something that i learned in overwatch picking up on the same tone that your co-caster throws to you and if you're trying to change the mood you make sure you lower your intonation by the end of your of your message and and then your co-caster should try to pick it up from that message and then carry it up if something hype happens again but kind of getting used to knowing when to take your tosses from co-casters carrying your energy even if you had to cast uh apac region like i had to for overwatch league which would start call time for me at three o'clock in the morning eastern yep. time and i would finish casting at 10 o'clock in the morning eastern time uh it was like how do i keep my energy how do i change my sleep schedule so that way i could be energetic at this time and and being able to work around the equipment was something on a completely different end but i made it work and now i'm so used to it like it's difficult to get me to want to leave sometimes but i do it because it's the experience of travel it's the experience of an arena and it's also being able to see friends that i haven't seen in years yeah your point about the i guess how you would uh, the fist bit that you talked about there being able to kind of allude to when you want a different point being made one of the things that i would do in our splatoon lands that we would have probably quarterly back in 2019 i think we were having them around that time maybe a little more frequently but there would be moments where somebody would be in a point and at the very top of a splatoon 2 screen you can see if somebody has a special or if two or three are down and I remember I was commentating with one of my buddies for the first time on land and three people went down when he was in the middle of an unrelated point. And I like pointed to it so hard that I actually almost pushed the monitor over because <laughs> it was it happened completely off screen and there was no idea. And part of it too is um, when there is a spectator cam, uh, which Splatoon does have and you put somebody on that, sometimes you can tell the spectator, hey, like get over to somebody just went crazy on the bottom half of the screen, like figure out what it was. But that... That picking up on someone's energy being so much harder online is 100% true. You have to be very intentional about it online because in person, if someone's excited, you can't help it. I challenge you at home the next time that you have a co-commentator who is really excited on land, try not to get excited. You can't do it. It's not possible. <laughs> yeah. You just... It's it's so easy to naturally flow with what the, what the like energy of the game is, but it's not so easy online you do have to be very intentional about picking up on the same sort of wavelength as what your commentator co-commentator is and it's especially hard to do if you're just working with that co-commentator for the first time Mm -hmm. so i guess if any of you at home are taking notes here of like what should i do if i'm casting primarily online try to match the energy of what your co-commentator is doing and do be intentional with it i mean even if your energy is more appropriate for the moment that might be happening it can be very jarring to hear someone be very like you know, stone-faced about a play that's mm. happening and then someone get exciting. Like, is one of them technically more correct? Like, maybe? But that doesn't matter. It's it's a team game here when we're trying to commentate together. So, yeah, um, uh, yeah it's, it, it's, it's so funny, though, to have it go from, like, a person who's usually commentating in person to then going online, whereas for us, it was always getting to commentate offline was, like, a big cherry on top of a Sunday. It was just the, the sweet reward for all the many tournaments that you've casted in person but one point that you did mention about commentating way way out of your normal time zone because there are a lot of big japanese tournaments in the splatoon scene and every once in a while we'll get to commentate one of those um it's similar like a 2 a.m call time you're just playing there so 
I, and this is also selfishly for myself because I'm really bad at doing this. How did you adjust your sleep schedule and like how Oof. did you actually manufacture legitimate energy when you're always tired when you wake up at that time slot? Yeah, so to start with the the negatives first, I, the, before I end things and wrap up this point with a positive. So I the first thing I tried was melatonin, and that was the worst mistake ever uh, because it was trying to reverse my schedule, but that ended up waking up extra groggy and not like prepared for the cast, thinking that I was using it to help my sleep schedule, but then I was also nervous, but then also excited. Every broadcast, this did not go away any of the broadcast, no matter how much the weeks went by, I was always felt the same way for every single broadcast uh, in the APEC side of things. And I, I, so what I would do is the day before, I would purposely stay up all night. And then during the day of, of the, during the, like the APEC day, I would sleep at night then wake up rather sorry sleep at, during the day and then wake up at night and i prepared that more than 24 hours in advance and i would do that time and time again where i constantly would just revert my schedule i would game all night get coffee i had monster it was convenient <laughs> because apex at the time had sent me two cases of monster i was like whoo let's go we are in this that's dangerous but <laughs> i would stay up all night go to bed during like what i think my time my my cutoff time was like 9 a.m. is when I would go to sleep and then I would wake up and sometimes it would be back and forth where I would wake up too early and I was upset because I'm like, man, I'm going to get tired later. I know I am. Or I wake up too late where I feel a little groggy an hour before the broadcast. And that was really difficult because it was on and off for the entire season because I was also double booked for Overwatch to do Overwatch contenders alongside Overwatch League. And I was the only other caster other than our other APAC caster, Avril, from Australia. I was the only other caster that was doing NA in, in Europe to be on that schedule at least for avril that's his time zone for me that was different because i would go from saturday sunday casting from 3 a.m to 9 a.m to uh monday casting contenders at 11 o'clock in the morning so i would immediately i wouldn't even have a day in between to change no. my schedule i would just have to kind of tank through it and then stay up the whole day that i would cast apac and then around 7 to 8 p.m i'd crash and then go to sleep and then wake up in the morning at a, a before 11 a.m to then get ready and do contenders from that monday all the way up to wednesday then we'll have a thursday break and then continue on friday and it, it was really hard now as time went on though and, and moving away from seeing the failures of melatonin and all that stuff i settled for tea green tea definitely really helped me cause, and it was it was a double whammy i was able to help out my own throat because i would put honey in my own tea um so i'd be ready vocally and it would wake me up i liked green tea a lot because for some reason i love coffee i'm a coffee person i drink like two cups of coffee a day it's bad but uh, cuban coffee is like the best for me oh. um yeah yeah and then that, i've coffee, heard i've heard rumors of, mm. of how strong that stuff is oh it is super strong especially a colada that's why they serve you in little shot cups um actually that's that's how they do it here in the cuban bakeries in miami so i would go from drinking coffee every morning to now trying to transition into drinking more green tea so that was at least the good part the good habits that i took away from casting those eight pack nights but i would have to like be mindful and pre-plan the days that i would have to hard reset my body which was usually a day to two days in advance before the APAC date that I would cast. Well, I know at least one person in our audience here has a Japanese platoon cast. Uh, so not to call out Magic 8-Ball, but uh, I hope you're taking notes here, buddy. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's transfer over here to what I think is going to be kind of the meat of today's discussion, which is mm -hmm. criticizing players. Because this comes up a lot in um, Splatoon, particularly because it does have a more grassroots feel, but the Splatoon player base is also very young. And a lot of our top players are very young. They, they've kind of gotten a little older now. They're getting into the collegiate ranks. But when I first started commentating, and especially Splatoon 2, you would have like 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds who were the ones that you were commentating. And I mean, personally, I felt horrible. Like, man, how am I going to tell this kid that he's doing a bad job when he has his driver's test tomorrow? Like, what? how, oh, how do no. I balance this? It's so difficult to do. And I'm not a super, like, rude, critical person on commentary to begin with. That's just not who I am. But... At the same time, people, I think, almost uh, glamorize, like, the real, like, oh, man, this guy sucks type of commentary, because it is fun in a certain sense, but there's a time and a place for it. So I'm curious here, mm -hmm. as someone who has gone from Smash, where you are flat out insulting the person who is playing because they're your best friend, to a more esports environment where it is their job, and you don't want to be, you know, talking bad about somebody's job while they're up there, 
first yeah. of all, I guess, what was that transition like for you? And then we can kind of dive into like how you do it properly, if you will, mm -hmm. um, on a live cast. Yeah, so personally for me, my style of commentary, I don't think, even when I was casting Smash, if it wasn't my local where I knew all the players, um, it was a lot friendlier like that, where even even when we had friendly banter, when I was on the mic, I would use it as an opportunity mostly to practice for, like, majors. Mm -hmm. So I feel like my niche and, like, what my theme as a caster was and what the Smash community knew me as before 2019 when I only did Smash was somebody who was too professional. And I say too professional because... We had it's it Smash. It, it is Smash at the end of the day. You had a lot of uh, players having a lot of fun, um, just kind of either trash talking or making pretty crazy jokes that you wouldn't really get to hear in any other environment. Myself, on the other hand, I I felt like I couldldn't get away. It like it wasn't my thing. Like I just mm -hmm. couldn't get away with it. It wasn't like something that I would touch up on uh, usually. So if I was in a national setting, I didn't really jab players for playing bad like that. I would just talk about it in a professional sense. Like you know they could have done this, or I'm not too sure why they tried to counter pick with this when they weren't really playing very well with their main in the first place. I could understand that maybe they think that this is a good matchup, but it's obvious that if they can't really do well with their main character, that this counter pick isn't gonna work either. I, that's kind of like how I would say in, in a very nice way, like, this is not it here. You got to put the, the <laughs> controller down. Sometimes I'd even have fun here. And and I, instead of talking about the player, I'd talk about the controller. Be like, oh, that controller is a little saucy. Or it looks like he's got to have to cut those that, the controller wire with a pair of scissors or something like that. Or look, he's getting a little mad. Because, you know, sometimes you also have players on the stage in Smash tournaments that would spike controllers. Yeah. As a caster, how do you uh, put a Band-Aid over that without making it awkward? Because you could hear them in the mic sometimes in the background, like, shouting cursing you're like wow well, well, that's a little awkward here <laughs> now and what was that like, i just heard what was that yeah I wonder. <laughs> it's like i hope the controller's okay like that's priorities <laughs> out here and so to like kind of glance over that how would you recover without making it awkward not just for you your co-caster but the audience more than anything um but when you when i am having fun and and i'm in my own zone where i'm with people that i know or um you get a read of the situation i think that's the most important thing knowing your environment and and really reading the mood of the room, if the tone of the room isn't everyone's throwing friendly banner at each other, it's not like couch summit commentary, which I think that's where it's appropriate because mm -hmm. it's summit at the end of the day and it's couch commentary for a reason. We're not in a suit and tie. We're not behind a desk. It's not like all these crazy like single cameras on an individual caster where it's not uniform. So I think depending on your environment, that's where you should get a read of the situation. For myself, I just never was that caster starting out, even learning how to cast, to be uh, somebody that would just throw trash at another player, depending on how they would play. Even in Overwatch, even in Apex, especially not in those games, um, for the reason that you just said. Like, they're here to, to work under under their organization. You don't want to tell a player that they're just bad at their job when they're already under pressure. But uh, when you get a good, proper read of the room and everybody's being funny, everyone's talking trash, I think that's when you should understand what's appropriate and what's not appropriate depending on the setting uh, because that's what I would do. If I feel like I'm comfortable out of my own zone and my co-caster is, is, has some friendly banter, I got some friendly banter with my co-caster, which a good example actually of a friendly banter that I have with my co-caster all the time was with Hazmat. Hazmat and I have that very friendly back and forth. I'm friends with Hazmat in real life. We've hung out multiple times in real life and so we transition that energy onto the mic and I know he hates Sora. He knows I love Sora. Sora. And so, like, if we see a Sora on the stream, we'll go absolutely wild. He'll just trash on Kingdom Hearts, and I'll be hyping it up. And that would be our dynamic while also focusing on the game. If there's a player that, uh, is like, for example, if Mars is on the uh, is on the stream, and we got Hazmat and myself casting, Hazmat is gonna trash on Mars because he knows Mars, and, and they have that friendly banter with each other. I do think it really does depend on the environment. It just wasn't something that I started doing at the start, because I didn't have the confidence to be able to say, yo, that guy's trash when i'm trash so yeah, exactly, it's just like right? it just like, wasn't something uh, i felt like i could say even as a caster i'm like hey you know this guy's obviously mechanically better than me for a reason yeah uh, one thing that um how i had it kind of framed for me when i was trying to find my own answer to this question because it's not an easy one um is uh jordan kent actually told me someone who you and i have worked with who makes commentary easy mode like i have so much respect for jordan he taught me a lot of what i know about commentary but he said if it comes down to it try to find a way to give credit so if one player yeah. made a really bad play, can you find a way to give credit to the person who made the play? Like if someone falls off the map in a crucial situation, like, 
okay, like you can't really spin that, but you can also just kind of poke fun at it because come on dog. Like it's the worst possible <laughs> time to do the one thing that you can't do. So, but you know, trying to give credit, I think also kind of helps train your thought process because when you get to the highest level, if one of these players does something really, really poorly, it's almost always because the other team did something that forced that situation. And trying to think about how to give credit will kind of, I, I guess, broaden the scope of how you're looking at these plays. If someone is standing right out in the open and gets sniped, instead of saying, why are you standing in the open, say to yourself, okay, what caused that person to be there? Because they didn't go there for no reason, man. They're trying to win the game. They practice this game all the time. They have an idea, at least. So that was, I think, a big turning point in my own thought process. And like you, you know, if I tried to start talking trash on somebody who wasn't one of my best friends, people would call me and be like, hey, you okay, man? Like, did you get replaced by somebody? Because that's just, it, it's not your style. If you're someone who has yeah. a lot of flair on their cast and, you know, that's more of just the way that you speak, that's your vernacular, then I think in that case, that is a strength that you can kind of utilize. But it's... Again, if you're someone, and this is kind of for you viewers as well who watch a lot of these, if you're just wanting people to constantly like trash and add a little flair to it, like, you know, again, first of all, consider what it is that you're watching, right? Consider that if you want to see somebody talking trash and raging, like, go watch any solo queue stream. You'll find it within 10 minutes, <laughs> someone will throw the controller and you can have it. But that's, I, I think that's such an important part of understanding, like, when it's okay to like fully criticize. You can say things like, you know, that player knows they have to hit that shot or they hit that shot 99 times out of 100 and this was the one time they missed it. There are ways to spin it to, you know, mm -hmm. give credit to this player who is very, very good and who missed their execution. And you can kind of spin it off there. But more than... I, I also think that just critical commentary is kind of bad like there's no substance yeah. to it like if you say yeah. you know oh this player is trash right now and it's not usually like that extreme but that's shallow man like there's there's pressure that you can say you can talk about why that shot was so difficult to hit but straight critical commentary isn't always very deep and even if you do want to like be in that environment of trash talking there's ways to go about it where you could be friendly you could do friendly trash talk where you could come off across as funny like you know if, if a player is shooting and the, there's a, like an actual player standing still in front of him and he's still missing all his shots against a player who's not moving it's like oh look at him he's hitting some ghost out here you know and <laughs> it's like you could pull away from that and then for example when you have some players that are also trash talking each other and they're like teabagging one another on an online game I I've come out. I've come up uh, from with Overwatch, and we kind of say it universally. Where if you see players teabagging one another to assert their dominance, you talk. You call it a tactical crouching. We mm -hmm. don't say teabag. We say, "Oh, he's tactical crouching." It's all about the mind games. It's about sending a message, and you get to be have fun with that because as a caster, you're enjoying it because you're still noting the obvious without trying sure, to be mean, sure. and so you're also having a good time because you're 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 still sticking to, to kind of like the funny talk, but you're not just downright rashing on the player either yeah exactly that squid bagging is what we call it in splatoon squid, because uh, yes that's yeah. amazing <laughs> well it, it's a famous thing too and reddit hates it which is how we know it's good uh because reddit hates oh. it but it's it's uh it's the same sort of thing and that conversation about like trying to play the mind games with your opponent is that legitimate or bad that gets tossed around like every i don't know, help me out here chat like is it every three months we have this conversation Oof. as the cycle always repeats but you know, I agree entirely. You can you can find ways to be critical that paint a broader picture of the game and don't make light of, you know, all the effort these players are putting in. Because especially when you start to commentate later on in the bracket and you hit the loser's semis, the winner's finals, loser's finals, grand finals, like, these people are putting their everything into this game and they have for a long time. And if you as a commentator can't respect that and find ways to call attention to that will also painting around the mistake that was made, um, you know, get better at commentary. Like that's, there are ways to do it. You can recognize the broader picture of what these players are putting into it without solely calling attention to the bad play. Cause they know they made the play. You telling them they shot like trash that trust me, they know, they know before you knew. So um, get creative with it. You can do it. I promise. Um, but we're talking about criticism here. Let's uh, flip it to the other side here, which is, we get criticized too for, uh, you know, sometimes legitimate reasons, sometimes not legitimate reasons. I always joke that the Splatoon community is way too soft with me because I don't get criticized nearly enough. They're way too kind. Um, but I know uh, Smash is not so much the same. And uh, the biggest, like, 
player in my scene, a player by the name of Dark Atma, uh, who you may be familiar with some. He's a melee player. He used to be a top 30 player in the world. He's a Sheik Peach dual main. Uh, he went on our Facebook, like our, our St. Louis community Facebook page, and posted a six-paragraph criticism of my commentary at one of the events. Now, that was a hugely formative moment for me, because everything he said was right. He said it very crudely, and it hurt, but it also was right. But there's also a lot of criticism that we get that is just, you know, not right. And so talk a little bit about how you receive commentary, how you parse through what comment, or not commentary, criticism rather, parse through which of it is actually worth listening to, how you go about implementing it. I'm curious because you have one of the biggest platforms in the game when it comes to commentary. Yeah, so when I started casting, I was 19 years old. I had just, uh, I just started college and I... I didn't go into casting thinking, or I didn't go into the community thinking, oh, I'm going to be a caster. No, I was a player first. So when I first started casting, um, the biggest thing that I would get a lot is, I can't stand her voice. It sounds like a little boy. Um, <sighs> it's just something about her intonation. Her accent is weird. I'm from Miami, guys, a Cuban-American. My last name is Perez. So <laughs> it was it was a lot of stuff. It, it was a lot of uh, strictly on my voice. And so then when, when I was asking for constructive criticism, it would get drowned out by the constant it's she sounds like a little boy like uh who is this little boy on the mic why does her voice sound so grating i just can't deal with that i, I can't understand her sometimes um and i had to understand at, at 19 which i'm not saying is very young but it was also my first time like getting to know like how to be on camera uh i had to realize that some things are important to listen to and some things are not important and what i mean by that is i literally stopped caring after a certain point and you just become numb i i, I know it sounds sad but it, it, you just at one point for myself i just saw those comments and i started laughing at them and then i started twisting them where it, it where i would always get the who's that little boy on the mic and then i actually made that my pin tweet for like three years and i made it where it was like i'm the i'm the one that sounds like a little boy when i commentate your matches and that was my pin tweet before i actually became a nintendo brand ambassador and i was so proud to announce that i became a nintendo brand ambassador so i replaced that original tweet with that announcement but i had that tweet originally pinned for like three years and i i live with it it's embracing it because i can't change my voice this is my voice this is how i talk mm -hmm. to my friends to my family Family, when I'm on the mic, when I'm off the mic, when I'm in my own games and in, in game comms, this is just how I sound. There is nothing I could do. I could try to force a, a weird pitch voice that isn't myself, but then it would be unnatural. I, I would eventually default to myself yeah. eventually. Like there was nothing I could do about that. But then when the actual constructive criticism came in, one of the best things that I learned after my first regional commentary session, which was only a month and a half of me casting ever, was uh, Vicky Kitty and her co-caster do not give each other breathing room. And so after that, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay quiet. And then when my co-caster with their intonation has the opportunity to toss, that's when I'll take over. Unless a very hype moment happens in like one of these play-by-play -play moments where somebody gets one-shotted and my co-caster's in the middle of talking, I'll be like, oh! And I'll like shout over that because it's like, that's insane. And it will also add to the hype of the moment because then other people will be like, oh, no way! And so I'm reacting essentially to the crowd. And I had to learn so my own pacing, how, how to give my co-caster breathing room. That was the first lesson that I remember I took on from my first uh, offline experience of just casting a regional that isn't a local either for Smash Brothers. Um, that learning uh, different pronunciations for different words, uh, different player names, where the regions it came from, that was something that's really important and still is really important and still oh, yeah. is Absolutely. something that I mess up to this day, especially since I cover APAC region. I, <laughs> it is so difficult difficult when you are so used to rolling R's and like you have you, you know you you usually see a lot of uh, or you're surrounded rather by a lot of Spanish speaking um, usuals in Miami going from that to casting over Korean or Chinese players is was extremely hard it was yeah. extremely hard and it's gotten a lot better now because I know how to ask for help now mm -hmm. I know how to reach out and say hey I want to know how to say this so that way on the mic we all say the same name consistently throughout the entire broadcast we did that in Sweden when I casted Apex and since it was an international event we went out of our way to ask the players and the coaches hey even if the players didn't speak English we asked the coaches for a translator hey how do we say his name and we don't want to do the player um, 
injustice either. We want to be able to right. actually boost their channel, boost their brand. Because when we talk about a player's name, it's their brand. It's not just the player themselves. Yeah, they're playing, they're performing, but a lot of these players have their own content that they work on. And when we're talking about the players, we want to be. That's a good point, Vicky. I think uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you maybe try to reload? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, we'll try to reload it. The link should be the same. How is that? Hey, Welcome we're back. back. Welcome hey, back. Hey, sorry about that. Okay. Not a problem. But yeah, if you guys heard me at the very end there, that's basically like those two main lessons that I took away from. Constructive criticism was also something that I highlighted more with my peers than I did with a general audience because I would actually reach out two casters like the casters from overwatch league when we were put together with them i would personally reach out with coaches in overwatch i reached out to um the british hurricanes coach about hey what do you think about the meta what do you think about your team and i would get all their input i would use their input and i would send them vods like hey did i do your team justice here did i say this properly did i convey the message that your team is trying to convey appropriately to an audience and i i would ask questions all the time um to the people that were also alongside me in the same industry tk ee -E, I would ask uh, so many different casters, what can I do better? I've even had a conversation with Golden Boy. And Ooh. it's understanding what their point of view is and kind of filtering what they know versus what a general audience knows. They could have their own valid criticism. They, If they think my voice is jarring, unfortunately, there's not much I can do about that. I could try to work on my intonation, though. So instead of taking it as a personal attack, I'm like, okay, maybe my intonation needs work. Maybe I need to understand how to deliver a sentence without it sounding so jarring. And so that way I don't end the sentence in a high note, especially remotely since it's important for my co-caster to be able to take from me like we talked about earlier. And so taking little feedback here and there and then knowing what is important and what isn't was the biggest thing for me. Somebody saying, this guy sucks. That statement has nothing to it. There is right. nothing to eat out of that statement. I, knowing that I suck, all right, dude, I suck, but I'm going to still like, do this tournament like tomorrow. So. <laughs> like, it's like, damn, you know? It's like, what can I do there? I'm sorry that you think that, but I'm still going to do me. If you don't get, tell me why I suck, there's no way I could work on myself so that way you don't think I suck. So, you know, help me help you in this situation. And, and that's just something that I had to learn, but something that took me a very long time to grasp. And that's something that I would tell to casters or rather up and coming casters that want to get better with their commentary is if you feel like you get shut down by Twitch chat or feedback that is just too harsh, that isn't constructive at all. I would recommend don't even look at the chat because chat is not there to to pay you. They're, they're not. Right. They're there exactly. to watch the game. And it's not just you that they're ragging on. They're rag on the players, the way the players look. It's, it's, it's just not constructive whatsoever. And I, I until this year, I have not casted with a chat open in the seven years of commentary. And it's worked just fine for me. And it's just knowing what to focus on and who to reach out to. If you re respect somebody and you've worked alongside them and you have connections with them, and you want to know what you could do better, reach out to them, ask questions, because that was something that I wish I could have done a lot earlier, was ask questions. That, that's such a great soundbite, too. If there was one soundbite to take from this all so far, it would be, in my seven years of commentary, I've never opened a Twitch chat. That's such a good, that, that's good to know. I'm very much the same way, um, so it's good to have a little validation for that approach. But your last point there that you made about reaching out to people that you respect, who you think give good commentary, that's such a great point because when I first moved away from um, from Smash Bros and started commentating Splatoon, I got different feedback from different people because it's a different game, a different audience with different expectations. When I started to cast uh, Friday Fortnite with UMG and you know just huge, huge content creators with these giant brands who were there, I got different stuff. I got called a boomer all the time because I made references to like arcade games and stuff. Like guys, I'm 28. Come on now, like I'm not that old, but the the different groups have different expectations and will have different criticisms. When I casted um, Minecraft Mondays, it was a different set of criticisms. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, there's going to be kernels of truth, right? So I think that one of the advantages of working with a lot of different co-commentators, working a lot of different games, I'm not saying everyone should go out and try to cast a bunch of different games, but you do need to, I think, broaden kind of the feedback that you're getting and try to diversify it a little bit because you can't go wading through every comment or every comment that's given about you to find a kernel of truth, but there is something to be said for 
different groups will notice different weaknesses in your commentary because they've been mm -hmm. trained to expect a certain thing on commentary. When I commentated at uh, DPG 2018 with uh, Max Ketchum, the thing that uh, I heard back from feedback there, and this was just from a YouTube comment because I went and watched it back, is they said, this commentary is super dry, but I kind of like it. And I never thought of myself as a dry commentator before. But when I commentated with Max, who has so much energy, I came off as a little dry. We met in the middle there, mm. and there was sort of a dry humor that we threw back and forth there. I never, ever would have even considered that as part of my like commentary repertoire until we cast it together. And it was so organic, and now it's something that I can, I won't say fall back on, but I look at it as another tool is, you know, if I have a co-commentator who has some energy, um, that is, you know, somewhere that I can meet them. And uh, Vicky, I think you popped out again. So I'm going to keep going here with my original point and hopefully uh, we can get a refresh. But um, the, uh, the, the big thing is, I would say when you diversify the different types of feedback that you get, you're also going to run into more people who you have a lot of respect for in the different kind of branches of what commentary is. So you'll find more people that you'll respect. You get more feedback from those people. And it'll be that much easier to really kind of hone in on what it is you're doing. Because like you said, Vicky, you can't, you can't delve deep into the masses of what people are saying because you're going you're gonna to hate all of it. You are going to be miserable doing this thing that you should be loving. So you do want to try to identify good sources of feedback, ask honest questions, and surround yourself with people who can give you that. I think I got everything working here too. I think that what it is, uh, nine is that my camera may be forcing itself to go on idle, and I don't know if it's an OBS Ninja thing or is it mine, but nonetheless, I totally agree with what you're saying. And sometimes you don't see certain things within your own commentary until you see a random comment like that, where I, where when it came to ending things on a high note and then if your co-caster doesn't pick it up on the same high note you referred to it earlier but it could sound jarring when somebody is being loud and then the co-caster overall is picking things up very low and i actually learned that after talking to some overwatch league talent i, I at 3 a.m it's a little difficult to have somebody <laughs> throw something a high pace at you high energy and you're like Yes, welcome to the Overwatch League. It's like, yeah, maybe in my mind, it's like the ASMR night show of like, we're going to do some play to play 6v6, like crazy chaotic commentary with like very monotone whispering. But that's obviously not what's happening. They mm -hmm. need that hype. They need that energy. And it was something that I, I've recently been working on when it comes to picking up a message and then immediately picking it up high pace. And then also changing the pace immediately depending if in apex for example a team is purposely hiding in corners because they're waiting to jump and sabotage another team that has no idea that there's a team hiding in the corners so like we'll like kind of like creep up with our commentary we're like oh 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 but look at this look mm. at this team they're creeping up and look what they're doing Love and it's kind of adding to the mood yeah. it's adding to the mood and it's so raw and awesome because you feel the energy even if it's low you feel the intensity of what's about to happen because you're leading up into a moment yeah the the jaws there are moments sometimes where someone will be sharking in splatoon it is a term where someone just hides in the ink and waits for people to jump out in the middle of this big chaotic play and there are moments where i'll just be like hey co-commentator da <laughs> da, na, da, na, 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 na. and like it's it's totally corny and cheesy but like in the moment like you said it adds so much to it and it, it builds up and it's a lot of fun so i i'm glad that i'm not the only one who likes a, a corny cheesy moment like that because it's it, it does add to it and i think you kind of alluded to it there like it's something that over time and experience you start to kind of identify where you can take that criticism and the expectations of the audience and and pull it through but uh, I do want to go to this next bit because this is one that I personally struggle with. So you will be teaching me how to deal with this. And that is the pressure of a large brand. And I, I hit this at the top at the very beginning because you have one of the biggest brands in the world of esports commentary. With all of the audiences that you built, the time that you've put into it, that has to be suffocating. And I only experienced a tiny, tiny piece of it when I was starting to break red with some of the big content creators in the Friday Fortnights and the Minecraft Mondays, and even just talking with other Smash commentators, it is so difficult. And I, you know, frankly, I, I dealt with it by backing away and being like, ooh, I flew too close to the sun here. I don't want to get burned. I'm pale as heck, man. I can't deal with this. So <laughs> like, what, how do you go about dealing with having a large brand, a large following watching you? I 
so first thing that I usually do when it comes to like dealing with a lot of eyes on you and and. I, I kind of don't believe it. I don't know why. It's just I, I'm like in denial, I, and I'm not even. I, I don't know. It sounds funny. Like I'm not even trying to sound humble. I'm just kind of in denial because to me, it's like I like to play video games and I like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's that's like the best way I could describe it. And it's like I am very competitive and I love. I want to be the best at the, any game that I play, even if I'm not a competitor. It's just that's my mindset. And then I like to like dissect games naturally like that's what i like to do as as the in-game leader in apex i love to I dissect why did we die here why did we win this fight etc and so when it comes to like being a caster when people are like oh you're so popular you're so famous i'm like i i'm don't i just talk about a game i just i, I don't know it's crazy <laughs> to me to think like that like because it's yeah. like hmm you know like i i don't know how i feel about this but when it comes to the added pressure though when you're at an event I see myself as representing the actual event. Um, so I try to like, I'm not trying to be rowdy or anything like that. Even after hours, even when we're off the clock, uh, I obviously have fun. It's all about moderation, but I, I still feel like if I'm there and I'm hired by the event itself to do something that would disrespect the events, um, even during the after hours and then show up on camera the day afterwards, it's like, oh, that's the girl that did i don't even know why like was acting rowdy last night or something like that it doesn't matter if she was off camera and or that's the girl that was insulting my friend while he was playing the set like off camera you know like it's just about how behavior and conduct is something that i think about and i don't have to think about it too much because it's kind of like it makes sense to me at mm -hmm. least um but then in my own personal life now let's take away the event aspect of it now in my own personal life it has made me filter a lot of the way that i am then with friends with friends i i it's kind of like what i was saying before i'm a goblin i i love playing games till super late i'll use it as an excuse to reset my schedule and i i love trash talking in these games i, I mean it's shooters at the end of the day i, I grew up playing Mono for two i love doing that obviously all in moderation appropriately, I rock my gamer tag, Vicky Kitty, in every game that I play. So if I were to ever get clipped, I know immediately where people could find me. And it's all about behavior, too, because even if you're trash talking in a game where you feel like your teammates are lackluster or whatever, everything has limits. And, and it's not cool to, like, say things to people that would make them, like, upset. I don't know. It's just, that's just how I feel. Um but then acting accordingly when I'm home and it's I'm still representing my brand. If I write something or I play a game under my gamer tag in a public lobby, uh, I felt that pressure of, hey, you better not like hurt somebody's feelings or, hey, you better not be bad because you're going to get messages or people are going to expose you that you're bad at a game. And sometimes it's like, well, if that pressure comes with it, I've gotten actually just yesterday in the Overwatch 2 beta, I was playing uh, my first quick play game of the day and somebody, in the, I actually didn't realize it until after it was too late because I went downstairs right afterwards to get a snack and I went upstairs and I saw that somebody was like, is that really Vicky Kitty? And it's like people like, hey, like recognizing me in the game, I've gotten messages on Xbox while playing Halo like, are you real? Or are you a simp? I'm like, what? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm Never like, mind. Oh, That's the new ah. audio clip. That's the new audio clip. Are you real or are you a simp? Those are the only two things you can be, everybody. You're either real or you're a simp. Let it, jot it down, then, bro. I'm, jot it down. It's so funny. And then uh, let me tell you, that's been a different experience because I've never played Halo. I've also never played on Xbox. But man, do people write messages like crazy on Xbox? And and I've always am the type of person I, I would never initiate messages, but I always stand my ground if somebody messages me first. And so, and obviously, all appropriately, uh, it's about just knowing what you should and shouldn't say, but also being comfortable being yourself. Because mm -hmm. that's what's important. That is something that I have recently started learning how to do again. Because at the start of my career, when I was 19, I got reached out to by Nintendo. My first event was a, a Nintendo San Diego Comic Con 12 and under tournament that summer. And I just first started casting. I felt like there was so much pressure. And I just wanted to, like, I gave them all my social media. I told them, vet me as much as you can. I know that they, there's nothing here. And so they did. They did everything that they needed. And I've been working with them ever since. But from that day on, I've always been extra attentive, making sure like not even red solo cups in my hand type of thing, like like just nothing like that. And I felt like it was taking away from what made me me. And I was I was being like this 
that whole uniform professional smash caster that none of the other casters are like that and then taking away my own individuality from it now that i've done more events now that i'm i'm doing other games and i feel like i have that same banter that i have in my games with my co-casters and and my approach to the game like oh that's broken like i don't care about saying if something is broken on the commentary if like a gun is busted i'll say that's busted like that completely changes the game for things i'm it's not like i'm thinking to myself like oh if i talk about this gun being broken is respawn gonna be mad at me because i'm highlighting like their poor game like like balancing like mm -hmm. you know it's it's nothing even though that's obviously something extreme to like default to that is stuff that i would think about sometimes and, and it would make things unfun for me and it became more of a chore than it felt like a hobby and so now i'm starting to relearn how to just be myself the way that i am when i play games with my friends i'm i'm like that now more on the mic when i'm talking to my co-caster and i get like i know my co-caster and even if it's even better if i know the players and i've casted the players forever and we have that relationship and then when i'm off the camera and when it's myself and i'm talking about things that interest me or if i happen to go stream which is like once in a blue moon um <laughs> i'm myself i'm myself the entire time i even had a rule where I didn't curse on social media. I didn't curse in my own stream because to me, I'm like, if I curse, like it's wrong. Like I can't do that. But then it's like, that's not me. If you think that I don't stub my toe and, and yell crazy things, like you got another thing coming. Like it, it's just, this is how I am. I'm human at the end of the day. And, and I'm also a gamer. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna feel oof. a type of way towards things. So yeah, that, that's my approach towards it. Yeah, it's it is so tricky when you feel like you have so many eyes on you that I think that sometimes you maybe even overestimate like what that brand actually brings. And I, I think that's where I kind of found peace with it is first of all, like you, I've always said that I'm a guy who loves Splatoon, talked about it a lot, and then one thing led to another and here I am. Cause that's kind of like my my mentality about it has always been, because kind of like you like I just my commentary was born from talking to my roommate at 2 a.m in the morning about Splatoon like that's how it started mm -hmm. for me and I got my first commentary gig not quite as grandiose as yours but it was in 2016 um at Don't Park in the Grass my first Splatoon gig was just because I happened to be sitting next to the commentary station and the person who was supposed to cast wasn't there like they weren't there and so the, they were just like hey we need something and i was only sitting there because i was watching smash 64 because smash 64 was in the same room as splatoon and also by the way dreamland 64 y'all think it's bad in melee imagine when that's the only stage being played on five different setups Ooh. at the same time all <laughs> desynced so that's a, that's a whole other thing but that i the the idea of like having to filter yourself online i feel like you always have to say the right thing there's a lot of pressure to that because there are lots of things, you know, even beyond the gaming world, just in the world that, you know, people want to hear your comments on because they look to you for something. And that's like, even if, you know, you're, even if you don't have anything like particularly egregious to say about it, even if you are like very confident in how you feel about certain things and that you're confident that, you know, you're, you're right within the greater good, like it's still difficult to feel like, oh man, are people gonna expect like a comment on this or that, the other, or am I gonna say anything that could be taken even remotely the wrong way yeah. about any particular mm -hmm. issue? And that's like, I'm a very like bleeding heart type as a whole, like a giant softy. So like, I'm, I, if I make any tweet whatsoever, there's no tweet that I send period without like five minutes of reviewing to make sure I did everything right. And that only got worse as I started to get more people like following and tuning into like my normal streams. That's part of the reason yeah. why I also stream once in a blue moon, uh, probably even worse than a blue moon. It's like once in a, I don't know, some other moon, harvest moon, we'll say. Um, <laughs> once in a harvest moon. But it, it is, it's it's difficult to deal with. And I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons I've always kind of respected what you put on is because you do interact with so many different audiences and all the other, you, you kind of alluded to earlier, like the criticisms that you get for things that you can't change, that, that is just built into your brand even on top of that. That's, I mean, I, I have a ton of respect for, you know, how you've dealt with that too, but it is kind of like humanizing to know that it's not something that comes natural that you kind of have to build your own relationship with. Yeah. Let me see here. Um, I know we've got a couple people here in the audience who've kind of put in their own questions. Osti trolling me as always, so nothing there has changed. Let's move to the hey. next topic here. He, he is here, and of course he's here. He, uh, Osti, don't worry. You'll get what's Austi. coming to you, buddy. He'll, you'll get you'll get what's coming to you. I I have plenty of stories I could tell you about Osti. Funs that he probably wishes I couldn't tell. But uh, oh man, and me too though. <laughs> <laughs> 
Watch out, buddy. Watch out. We'll Don't share be... them. We'll share them. We'll trade them like Pokemon cards. Oh, there we go. Okay, I have an Osti La Vista business card, so I can trade you a physical card. How about that? <laughs> oh, that's not an addition. I need one of those. What the heck? Well, he probably has a few left. But um, this actual topic here, this is one that I know a few people were really wanted me to talk about, so we got to give some time to this one, which is where do newer casters struggle? So we've now talked about how we criticize people, how we deal with criticism. So now we're going to do that. We're going to do a little criticism here. But I actually have a really good one here at the very start of like where the one thing that newer casters I feel like really struggle with that I, I think is maybe the most important, and it is to... Um, be excited about your cast. And I know that that seems maybe a little bit odd is of course I'm excited, but I've always viewed excitement as what fuels good commentary as a whole. Because if you sound disinterested in the fact that you are commentating, I don't care if what you're saying is objectively correct and you got every piece of frame data in your sentence correct. Like I flatly do not care because if there isn't excitement, that's difficult. And it should be noted here, I'm not saying that you have to yell and scream like every bit of shout casting here. That's not what excitement is. If you're talking with a buddy and you two are talking about the game last night or a show that you're watching, whatever it is, you will be excited talking to each other and you're not yelling at each other. You're not spouting off phrases at each other all the time or rehearse things like that, but you are excited talking to each other. So think of it like that. Try to, and if you're nervous, you will be excited. It just comes with the territory. Nervous and excitement are two sides of the same coin. Yep. But, you know, let that infect. Don't feel like you have to get everything right. And I know you will when you're new because we all do. I was so, like, scared that I was going to get something wrong. But same. It's. I, I think that when you are excited and it comes through, you will, like, you will trip over certain potholes as you go through. But if you're excited, you will then turn that into a sick roll, pop back up and keep your pace because yeah. that's, I, you cannot, there is no replacement for excitement on a cast. If someone is bored on their cast, you will know. You cannot hide it. You, I mean, even the people who have done hundreds of casts of all of these big games, um, like Al Michaels, for instance, big football commentator, I've read his book. One of the things that he says in his book is that even after all these years, he still gets excited for every broadcast that he does. And he's about to make $20 million from Amazon, so I'd be excited too for that. But, you know, it's that is, I think, the biggest thing. And when I have a co-commentator who is clearly nervous and clearly excited, that's when I know I'm going to get a good cast. I may not know everything about what mm -hmm. you're bringing to the table, but you're excited. That's enough for me. You do your thing. I'll fill in the blanks, and we can go from there. Yeah, I'm actually always excited and, and so genuinely happy to cast anything. I, I don't know why. I think I just really like casting. But, <laughs> but to give it like a constructive outlook, when you go into a block and you sound like you have no energy, your co-caster is going to be feeding off of that. And then they're going to feel like they're jarring because if they're too high energy and you're too low energy, they probably don't want to rain on your parade here. So they're, they're going to try to at least try to even things out or try to match that energy there too. And then in turn, you're going to get a very low energy commentary block. I think what a, a lot of casters do that at least newer casters, especially in the FGC specifically, they try to be analytical about everything. Yeah. And that was something that I had an issue with actually where I would talk about frame data, talk about what was true. And that was actually until probably like the year before the pandemic where I'm like, why? Like, it doesn't like, I, it doesn't matter. What matters is what's safe, what's not safe and why it got punished. Like, why do I have to break down? Like, well, actually this frame, this move comes out frame three and the, you know, it's too much to say while well, something else is happening. Yeah. And I, I think when you get something wrong, let's say you are speaking in, in specific terms and you're off by a point. Now you're going to have people be like well that's not right now it's not right uh, instead of frame eight it comes out frame nine get your facts straight caster and then like now you're opening up the book for things for other for other viewers to like actually like rip you apart for um i think that is definitely something that that casters should like tone down a little bit in terms of being analytical it's okay to get some things wrong don't put yourself in a position where you uh, so a rule that I have because I'm not good at math. I know there's other casters <laughs> out there that are just not only good at speaking, but they're also good at uh, doing math on 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 the fly. 
I never do math on commentary. Nope. Don't do math on commentary. If you feel like you cannot get it right, don't do math on commentary. That would be my number one thing to say. So aside from like getting framed out of right and trying to add up points in real time, if you're just not sure, even if it's basic math, don't sound like a dummy. Just take a step back and, and try to be like, you know what? Estimate. Estimation is beautiful. I estimate everything because you don't want to speak in specifics. You don't, you don't want to be in, a, in an extreme caster. Like this 100% happened because of this. Like mm -hmm. for all you know, that player could be sick and that's you know that player just unfortunately just was narrowly out of that window and uh, a window that would be a, a combo and so aside from making sure your tone is right you sound excited because if you're excited to cast a game then your co-caster is automatically going to be excited and then the audience is going to be excited depending on the time of day where their time zone is if they're just waking up maybe you are their cup of coffee mm -hmm. and if you are moving away from from that mood and not being so analytical i think one other thing that newer castle new York casters struggle with is uh figuring out how to get the opportunities that they see other casters get and i've gotten this a lot actually and it's so difficult to repeat it over and over again because it's kind of like the same answer that I don't know how to elaborate more on because they're like, but how? And it's like, I can't do it for you. It's like, this is how I was able to do it. This is how I know other casters have been able to do it. But beyond that, if you're wondering, how do I get into these bigger tournaments as a new caster, you need to literally keep grinding locals into regionals, into majors. And then from majors, you talk to everybody. You talk to your co-casters, you get to know them, you get to know why they're up there with you, you get to know what style of casting they like, you nerd out with them. You're at a tournament at the end of the day. I nerd out about the game. I'm going to nerd out about commentary. Like, I have all these questions. I'm here in person. I'm going to be able to talk to them about what I need to talk about. Because these are the only group of people that I can at home. Right. My <laughs> friends at home, yeah. You know, like, the friends at home aren't going to nerd out with me about that stuff. So if you have anything to say, that's a form of networking right there. It's not yep. just you making friends. It's networking. You're getting to know other people. You're getting to know the production crew. What goes behind uh, the changing the scenes? Even if it's so, so simple as changing scenes in OBS. Like, what can I do to make your job easier is this lighting good what about this lighting like little things like that broadcast as a whole is more than just the casters yep. it's also the production crew too make sure you're polite to them um if you have questions if you want them to do something better let them know constructively i've done that so many times in remote positions with um with even pgl a big production company like pgl will do a feedback session at the end of, uh, of our block and i would talk to them and i've had such an amazing relationship with the pgl production crew where i'd be like i would love more like uh third person shots in apex so that way i could see like different creative angles of them approaching the same fight because we always see first person angles so like tell the observers hey we would love to see this observers are something else not in like the fgc space exactly but we have observers and observer crews in overwatch and apex where it's a crew of people that you also get to know find out why they look at certain fights tell them what to highlight certain players that are important we had Nick Merckx and Snipe Down in the same lobby in the last ALGS LCQ, which was last weekend, which I was like, hello, even though it's Nick Merckx and there's a bunch of other like teams here, it, Nick Merckx is here and he's bringing a bunch of viewership. Let's mm -hmm. highlight the fact that he is popping off in the kill feed right now. And at one point, the Observer swapped over to him, but it was a little late after he had just popped off. So I, I wrote that out because the Observers reached out to me like, hey, we had so much fun. What do you think we could do differently? And I was like, oh, perfect. Point A, point B, point C, bada bing, bada boom. Now everybody He's happy and establishing a, a communication and a connection with more than just your co-casters the audience and the game but with also like the production crew and the observers is super important and the suggestion that i would give to newer casters it's more than just the casting it's everything before and afterwards yeah and especially in grassroots scenes right like the single biggest way to get I guess, bigger gigs, if you will. I know the Splatoon fans in the crowd are like, oh, bigger gigs, we get 50 viewers instead of 10 viewers. But, like, y'all got to understand that, like, initiative and, in, like, general interest, ge general genuine interest will be enough to kind of move you up that ladder because there are so many events that go on that would love to have someone who's engaged with that event. And I'm glad that you brought up that point, Vicky, because, like, Showing a, a TO or a broadcast team that you are interested in their product that they are pulling together is going to get you more opportunities. And that's the thing that I always look for when I like asked people to recommend like, hey, who should we bring in a cast on this? Or hey, who would you like to co-commentate with? The thing that I look for is how engaged is this person with the event, with the scene, and with the craft as a whole. And all of those things for a lot of people come very organically. Like 
I, it, for me, and it sounds like for you as well, you did all those things because you enjoyed them and it was just part of the entire experience for you. So I guess in that sense, you know, we didn't really have to force it, but I think that like, that's the mentality you have to have if you're trying to move, you know, up the ladder, if you will, is the more engaged you are with these events, the more chances you're going to get. And um, it doesn't really fall into the same point, but you brought up something earlier here that struggles that you see with FC or FGC casters in particular. I struggled with this. This was maybe my biggest struggle when I started off. I saw commentators that I liked. I saw what I liked about them, and I did the worst thing, which was I tried to be them. And boy, oh boy, that doesn't work. You will never be able to pull out the quotes that Wobbles and Homemade yep. Waffles do, no matter how hard you try. I loved what they did, and I wasn't thinking critically enough about why I did it. It wasn't the fact that Homemade Waffles said a sick catchphrase. It was that he mastered the exact moment where that needed to come in, match the moment's energy with an inside joke that could then be transferred all over. He probably didn't even know he was doing all that. That's his gift. He is so good at it. One of the best um, in, in the Melee scene. And Wobbles, his ability to dissect a play with just like one little quip at the end. Wobbles is my favorite commentator in anything ever. And it's because he never, no moment ever seems too big for him, despite how wild the thing that's happening is. He always seems like he's in control of what the situation is. And I always thought that that was just him being very even keel. And that's not necessarily what it was. It's that he's incredibly smart. He can succinctly make points. And I think that that is something that any caster of any level can do. But I think that newer casters, because they are so new to it, they know what they like, but they aren't entirely, they haven't quite digested why they like it yet. They haven't taken the base concepts of it and then applied it to what they are comfortable with and what they're good at. So I think that that was, I mean, it took me probably a good, like if you look back at my old Splatoon things, you will hear word for word, bar for bar, things that Smash commentators had said like three years before. And it like took me so long to feel confident in taking what I liked about those and then applying it to what I would say. And so that is, I guess, for anyone who is still new here, you might not even recognize that you do it yet. It's totally fine to admire commentators, to like certain things about their about what they do. Don't parrot their words. Parrot why they mm -hmm. said those words. Look at why they did what they did and how that leads into really what they say as a whole. Let me see here. I know I kind of just talked about my big struggle, so it's it's nice that I have this graphic to pull up here as well. I'll pass it back to you here. What did you struggle with early on? Because, you know, you've said you're only human. That's hard to believe sometimes with the accolades that you have. But what what, are, what were your big struggles early on? I feel like uh, understanding the feedback part of what we're talking about, understanding what was important to listen to and what wasn't, um, it definitely weighed on me mentally. And because of that, it affected my commentary. I wasn't, it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about taking quotes from other casters. I wasn't necessarily doing that, but instead I was overthinking the way I was casting. I was like, am I not funny enough? Am, am I am I just too analytical? Am I too hard on myself? Is it really my voice? Like, is it is it the accent that people keep bringing up? Because I, to me, obviously, I don't think I have an accent. But it was like a lot of those little things that I started weighing on my own mental. And it's like, maybe this isn't for me. Like, maybe I just should just, you know, just put the mic down and then – with the help of like my peers, I was like, no, no, this is ridiculous. I don't know why I'm thinking like this. I, I need to keep going. I need to keep going forward. And and it was carrying the momentum from one event to another that I, I wanted to, I, I use as a crutch to make sure that I picked myself back up instead of uh, just not casting again. And a lot of my uh, my friends in, in the commentary community for Smash could attest to that. They they were there. They were there for me when when my head was down and that I needed somebody to lean on, and they were always there for me. Austin was around there too. You know, we were talking a little bit about Austin. He's seen a lot of that stuff go down, and it was definitely hard. It was about keeping my mental right and maintaining my confidence. And I have now built my confidence. It feels like I finally have been able to rebuild anew. And earlier on, it was I was so critical of myself it was not only that but the pronunciation for certain things were were really off for me sometimes too because i i do think i have a goofy way of saying some things and so keeping myself and steering away from the way that i say certain things versus how i should portray a message to to a broad audience was something that i had to be mindful about too so beside that and then my own mentality and and making sure that i have the confidence that i i'm genuinely doing this because i love the game i love talking 
talking about the game. I love feeling like I am the bridge between a, a sponsorship opportunity and these players finding success. That was what allowed me to focus on what was important. And and earlier on, I didn't know that. I had to learn that as I went through. I had to have my my co-casters that are now my best friends like just help pick me up and tell me, you got this. And so when I had all this help and assistance and, and put myself in the right place, having my own mental break and breaks in general, super important, especially if you're dealing with burnout. If you're juggling casting, playing, mm -hmm. streaming, jobs, you know, a lot of us are adults uh, and that work nine to fives. And it's difficult to, to be able to, to juggle all this stuff. Taking a mental break helps a hard reset. And then when you find yourself casting for the first time in, let's say, three months, your approach may be completely different than when you were first casting. And I needed that reset because I did have a reset very similar to that, not because of my bad mentality but because it was the pandemic that forced me to figure out like what is next what's going to happen right. what about the smash tournaments and so i was put into a forced reset and then that forced reset went from me not casting smash for nearly a year to then playing and casting overwatch so now it was a completely different game but i i know how to cast i've casted for all these years it's not like like eight months was going to make me forget how to cast, right? So then I had to just take a completely new approach. And it did allow me picking up the pacing for that new game to be a lot easier. But it was all a mentality thing. And it was reworking my mentality that I had from Smash into Overwatch. And knowing that these are two different communities. That this was some... I'm, I'm basically making a first-time impression within Contenders. And I didn't want to soil it. <laughs> It's the positive feedback is such a, an important part. And it's, you know, a good reminder that, you know, no matter how untouchable your mentality is, like you will get burnt out if you keep doing this. And that, that's such a great point. And again, it's one of those like humanizing moments is like, yeah, even the people who are at the top, like they need a little, they need, they need a positive reinforcement system yeah. or they will start to crash. And um, I, I, I think that the other kind of, addition to that from a from like a mentality perspective is like understanding that there are times where you have to give yourself a break there was when splatoon mm -hmm. 2 came out i was casting probably six or seven tournaments a week and oh that was a lot which should tell you how many tournaments we were having at the time but like there were days where i would cast three tournaments in one day i would wake up at 3 a.m to commentate a splatoon a, a japanese tournament there would be a midday tournament and then an exhibition at night and like there was a period where I hated the game and I had to say like, dog, you don't hate this game. You love this game more than anything. Why do you hate it? What are you doing? And it's like, oh, you're spending, you're spending 30 hours a week talking about yeah. it. No wonder you hate it. So yeah, the, the note about a break is, is so good. And particularly for those um, of you maybe who are in the Splatoon scene who are engaged from like a content space and then you commentate while also scrimming on a team, like dog, you're going to break. Something is going to give and you're going to hate the game. Don't let that happen. Like try to be very honest with yourself about where the breaking point is going to be. Give yourself a rest because no one needs to hate their favorite game. That's, yeah. that's the big thing. And um, uh, we did get a question here. I, I do want to get to the rapid fire here, but I want you to answer this question because this is a great question. And it kind of like, it builds into something you said earlier. So Magic 8 Ball asks, uh, when you made the jump from hobby to profession, or when did you make the jump from hobby to profession and how did it happen? You kind of built on that a little bit earlier. But like, where was that moment and what did that feel like? I, it felt more like a hobby when I first started casting and then Nintendo reached out to me and I was like, wow, this is like a big deal. Like this is an actual thing that I could work on. And then I started getting invited to cast Smash tournaments. And then it, to me, it was a hobby because I was a full-time student in college and I was studying first for uh, for psychology and then eventually made the swap in the middle of me casting to media broadcast and journalism and then from there i swapped journalism to public relations and media broadcast and so like i i have had to go through the transition of i really like casting how do i make this a career can I transfer this to maybe something in real life? And then I even got an internship with Viacom when I was doing smash events and I was, I was doing full-time school. And then I was working behind the scenes uh, at a, it's basically the Latin American like HUD for Viacom in Miami. And I worked on Nickelodeon, MTV, and they were all Spanish shows. I worked on two specifically called Swipe Day and Vicky RPM. And that was a whole different experience where I realized, man, I really like gaming <laughs> because I was doing this TV production stuff. But I was like, I really like 
I, I it was a part of me that liked the scuff setups that I was so used to, but mm -hmm. also just like the fact that there were video games and that there was strategy behind it all. Um, I I liked production as a whole, but the gaming part was what was lackluster, and. So when I made the transition from hobby to career, I had to tell myself, how do I make this into a career? And my answer to that was I need to get into being analytical with every game that I play because I'm already analytical with every game that I play. I, it's more so competitive instead of digging deeper into it. It's like, again, like what I said before, how do I get better at this? And so I took what I already enjoyed and it ha what you said about Splatoon happened to me with all my games oh mm -hmm. by the way it happened to apex it happened to overwatch and it happened to smash i was just digesting so many hours of gameplay that the last thing i wanted to do after casting apex for over 12 hours in one day was go before going to bed playing apex that yeah. i just some nights i did do that crazy enough i like at the start of me casting i was so hyped i was so happy i was so proud of myself i was in like just loving the fact that i was doing a game that i love and then as the months went on and the casting days got longer and I had multiple casting days in a week, for example, uh, if yesterday was the end of the week, I have put in over 64 hours of casting in the last seven days. Casting gameplay. That's a lot. That's a lot. And I today I've, I've been able to relax, reset a little bit. I've had coffee in the morning. I was able to have a nice breakfast. And... That's when I realized, man, when every single day of my May is busy, I I think this is not a hobby anymore. This is a career. And that was a separation, though, because now I'm turning the, the activities that I would have fun in my free time to this is what I would do to make sure I'm studied and up to date with what's happening in the meta for when I cast. And you need to have a proper balance. Even if it becomes your career, you need to have a proper balance or else your genuine love for the game will end you're not going to end up playing the game anymore you're going to feel out of practice you're going to get on the mic and you're not going to feel confident because you feel guilty for not playing the game and i've had to go through those notions I've, I've i've been going through those notions even if i'm taking a break from a game that i haven't played very often or i have only fun playing in a certain environment like for smash i love playing with a good amount of my friends i can't play smash by myself or when i'm doing uh, viewer battles that was also another time that i had a lot of fun but i just can't in my own space not have fun with that game when i'm alone and it's just me labbing out i love to just play with a group of friends the cpu cannot even carry that same amount of energy so making sure for myself that i was i had a proper job struggle of my own mental health, how to take care of myself, while also making sure that I could put food on the table, um, but I'm doing something that I genuinely love, and my schedule got filled up, that's when I realized, all right, this is not a hobby anymore. This is definitely mm -hmm. a, a career path that I'm starting to take because I was getting booked. I didn't have a free week. I don't have a free weekend this this month. I didn't have a free weekend last month either, and it, it's just my entire schedule is, is packed, but I did something last year. And I, I tested my limits and I told myself, how many games can I do in a day? That was the worst mistake ever. By the way. <laughs> that, <laughs> that day specifically, I would never forget. And, and that's when I learned never double dip. And I've been asked to double dip this year. And I said, no, because last year I finished an APAC cast and I, I wanted to get my foot in through the door with Apex Legends because I've never done an ALGS before. And I got asked to be a single day guest. And so to me, I was like, this is my moment. This is my big break. I have to leave a good impression. I'm so excited. So earlier in the day, though, that was the only day that they were giving to me. And since I had to cast Overwatch League APAC, I said, I can't say no to APAC because I'm contracted, obviously, even if I'm busy, but I can't say no to my only opportunity that was just given to me to cast ALGS. So I did APAC, which call time was at three. That happened to have five game series. So it went to the literal last game. It always for does. The it always does. I know. And it was for the two series that I had to cast, which max is two series per caster. Right. Um, if you're there for half the day, you only do one series. And so I did two series. By the time we ended, it was 10 a.m. I had... Um, one of the observers messaged me from for the Apex Legends Global Series event saying, hey, just saw Overwatch League. You did great. Don't know if you know this, though, but call time for championships is in two hours. And I said, what? Call time is in two hours? I haven't slept. Understand that after APAC, I would go to sleep. Call time was in two hours, so I didn't sleep that day. I stayed up for over, I think it was like 26 hours because I was up the day before. And I 
cast at Overwatch into immediately being an analyst for Apex Legends because I just didn't want to pass on the opportunity. I remember that when we wrapped up the show, it was 9.30 at night and everyone was super excited. They, they were all so nice to me. And I said, well, guys, I don't mean to cut things short, but I haven't slept, so good night. And they were like, what? And I just, like, I went to bed. Like, I exited out, and I, I quite literally, like, like threw myself on my bed, and I knocked out. And then you would think, man, casting, gaming, that sounds like the dream. That sounds awesome, which it is amazing. It is awesome. But being good to yourself means that you're going to have nice commentary on any yeah. of the games you did. Because I was beating myself up for being so tired on the Apex, my first ALGS opportunity. And I was like, how could I have let this, like, how could I have let this happen? I was so low energy. I was so tired. Like, I wish that I I was able to separate the events and I, and I, I couldn't at the time because that was my only opportunity. So something that I, I need to be better about after that event was time management. And mm -hmm giving myself time, knowing not to double dip on a game on the same day, uh, understanding how crucial getting used to time zones are. So like that crazy reset that I would usually have if I travel to a different country, I would I would stay up the entire day, the day that I would be flying in, and then I would sleep at the nighttime, uh, wherever the time zone I was at, depending on where I was. And then now that I've learned all that from last year's mistakes, I'm actually, I have one big event booked in July and I'm already getting to a point where I'm not having any more events in July. That is going to be my off time. I'm going to give myself that break to mentally reset, catch up to date with the metas that I'm playing, with the games that I'm playing and and be good to myself because that was something that I wasn't good to myself. And in 2021, at the end of 2020 specifically, 2020, I was, I was given some bread and I was like, man, this bread is delicious. I want more. 2021 yes. here's all the bread in the world i'm like oh my god it's a buffet of bread i love bread i hope they're all cuban bread and then at the end of 2021 i crashed and burned and then felt guilty about it and mm -hmm. i was put into a weird mental space and said i'm never doing this again now 2022 i'm going to be good to myself and that's what i'm going to prioritize now is my own mental health and a proper balance in work because even if it isn't commentary even if it's something that like you're working over 50 hours a week and you have no time to yourself to even meal prep, to even cook yourself dinner because you're so mm. tired. I think understanding when you're at your limits is super important. Yeah, crazy important. Magic, there will be a test on that. Since that was your question, I will be quizzing you on making sure you got all of that taken in. <laughs> and this just, this just makes me even more thankful. I know to, to say that you're busy would be the understatement of the century, but uh, all the more reason to thank you for stopping by today because... I know you got a lot going on and we appreciate it. And because of that, um, this rapid fire here at the very end is going to go nice and quick for you because uh, these are these are fun little questions. I will be asking this to everybody in the commentator speaker series. So uh, this should be good. So we're going to start with a game that you wish you could cast that you are not currently casting. Could be anything. Mm, that's an interesting question. You know what? I'm going to throw it out there. Halo. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely want to do Halo. I hit Onyx. I've never played Halo before. Played Halo for like two and a half weeks. Hit Onyx in those two and a half weeks. I was like, man, I'm kind of godlike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. how it starts. <laughs> Exactly. It's literally like that. It's That's my mindset for everything. It's like, if I'm too good, I guess I got to cast the game. And that's my mindset towards these games all the time. And mind you, I didn't even know what the maps were called yet. I was like, I don't know where we are, but like that weird map that has a hole in the middle that seems completely unfinished and bad. Yeah, that's a map where like I like got 25 kill streak because I'm so good. That that's the best commentary approach ever. It's like, hey, I don't know all the specific terms, but I can tell you the macro and I can tell you I'm better than you. So uh, that's all I need, man. That's all I need. <laughs> Uh, question two, your favorite commentators, who are they? Oh, this is great. So Uber as play of play has to be like my number one up there. Um, hmm, man, I have to actually think this out. I love Uber. I love Fallout from Apex Legends. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing caster. He also casts Gears of War. Um, Biggest inspiration. She may not fall under uh, commentators, but she was a huge inspiration for me when I was uh, an up and coming caster. Was Zoe from the Overwatch League? Amazing host. Love her sense of humor, and I love her 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 energy with her other co casters. Um, Hazmat. Hazmat has to be up there, one hundred percent. Hazmat. If I talk about Smash casters, Hazmat, Bam, Charles, TKEE. -E. 
those guys are legendary to me. I love working with all of them. I love this the dynamic that we all have within our own little group, but also the way that they commentate. I can nitpick everything that I love about each and every one of their commentaries, and they're all different. All all of them, they're all different. Uh, so I guess I have like a huge umbrella of commentators from different games oh, that yeah. I really enjoy. I'm trying to think if there's a, a cast. Of, oh, you know what? We talked about Halo. I think Ansa and Gaskin are an amazing duo. And then separating away from that, two other duos that I also watch a lot and I love listening to their podcast, Bren and Sideshow. And then I'm going to have to end it there. Or else I'll start. I feel like I'm just naming everybody, but I, like Bren and Sideshow is, is where I'm going to end it, well, though, because they're amazing. <laughs> It's, it's authentic. Like, if you have to name all of your favorite casters, like, casters are fans of casters. That's just how it works. Like, I, I'm That's the true. same way. So, um, yeah, there was no way I could make you name just one. But I will make you name one moment here. This is the hardest question of all. Favorite moment you've casted. Ooh. You get one. One. There's no... Oh. You can't one half of one, six dozen... You, you have to... One. You only get one moment that you've casted, and it has to be your favorite. Okay. I think casting the Smash Ultimate reveal in 2019 at E3 must have been my most favorite moment I've ever casted. And, and that has to be hard. Like, cl a close second has to be the ESPN Top 8 Evo that I was able to do as, like, my first, like, big event. I, like, threw up a little bit in the morning. Like, oh, God, this is happening. Like, I don't know what's going on. Like, really, this is happening. And I was freaking out the whole time. But it has to be E3 because when it's like all the little mini moments leading up to nintendo taking us into a side room with all like the invited players and then showing the different rosters and the ultimate characters i remember jumping up with joy screaming like there was crying in the room it was so dramatic but it was so raw with emotion and fun and then the big stage happened and i was so nervous but the moment we started talking about the game that was it. it. I wasn't nervous anymore. It's still Smash Brothers at the end of the day. And I had so much fun. And then the aftermath was, wow, I did it. Like, even though we've done E3 before in the past, it's different. It's still that anxiety oh, so that it's you're, you're the day before when you go to the tech rehearsal, you're sitting on the edge of your seat. Nine, you know exactly what I mean. And you're sitting there. You're like, man, I hope I really don't mess up tomorrow. One like, sentence. Get through one <laughs> sentence. One sentence and you're fine. But if you don't get through that first sentence, you are falling off the stage, man. Oh, my God. It it's 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 just a, a spiral of man you can't like psych yourself out because you will psych yourself out you need to you need to understand that you're here for a reason and even though i'm like sometimes i'm like in disbelief because i'm just like well, how am i really here right now like i it's just like this is crazy to me still to this day i feel that way when i was doing the apex event i was feeling like this is crazy mm -hmm. um and so when I was able to to do the E3 event, the aftermath and and the after party and and talking to the Nintendo production guys, how awesome they felt, how how excited I was for Ultimate, I was like, okay, so when can I play again though? Like the yeah. the term is done, but I want to play right now. That must have been my most favorite moment I've ever casted. Yep, you you gave my favorite moment too. Like that night, I will never forget so much. You could you could write three podcasts on that. One final question here, and then I'll let you promote yourself and get on with your day. The greatest piece of advice you've ever received. And I originally was going to say related to commentary, but you know what? It doesn't have to be strictly related to commentary if there was another piece that you got. But what is it? Um, Don't let the haters make you quit something that you really enjoy doing because then you're just feeding into what they want do what you want what you have your eyes on and even if you're if you change your mind down that line just note that you should always do what makes you happy even if it feels impossible to you there's always a way to get to what you want it's just the way that you go about it between networking knowing the right people practicing getting better you could do whatever you want as long as you put the time and effort into it because I have written I've written so many pages and pages and pages on notes to make sure that I get something absolutely right but you won't ever get something perfect it's no matter what broadcast no matter the years that you've been casting you will never go through a broadcast without slipping up on some words i mean even in this podcast here i've slipped up over i don't even know how many words because i'm tired we're here we're having fun <laughs> and don't beat yourself up over it because yeah. that's when you start spiraling again you start slipping way more often you focus on that one moment know that if you have something in mind that you want to do something then do it you just Understand that there's always a process to it. And if you feel like you're lost, don't be afraid to ask questions because that was something that I learned to do later on in my career. Yeah. 
question's super powerful. And it's, it's a great piece of advice too, because like you said, it's that mentality that, that keeps you going through the stumbles that you will have. And man, that's good. I need to, I need to implement that. That's ah. Vicky, this has been awesome. And I want to thank you again. I know the audience has been enjoying this too. This VOD will be up on YouTube, but taking some time out to do this. I had an amazing time here. Um, I hope you did as well. When we were talking oh, before, we were like, we could do this for hours, uh, but we're going to yeah. try to cut it because I know eventually you've got another cast coming up. I've got a show I've got to run tonight. So what? Where, where can people follow you? What do you have on the near horizon? Tell the people what's going on in the life of Vicky Kitty. Yeah, I mean, you guys have my Twitter right above here. On this side, right above here, it's going to be at Vicky Kitty. I usually just stick on Twitter and talk about what next events I'm going to be doing. Um, or if I have that once in a blue moon stream, which I'm going to try to do a lot more often once I do take some time to myself. You guys can follow me on Twitch at Vicky Kitty, just like it's spelled up here on my Twitter handle. Uh, on the horizon, I actually am going to be casting Overwatch League this Friday. And it's going to be the North American Times, too. So you guys could definitely catch that at a much appropriate time now rather than the APAC times that we were talking about before. I'll be casting Overwatch League with Necra, so it's going to be a really fun time. My next event after that will be some Smash uh, viewer battles as well as Bamboo battles on Monday, so it'll be next Monday coming up. Got a lot more events coming up soon too, but I could get through a whole list and then I'll be uh, breaking a few NDAs, but I really appreciate <laughs> you having me here at night. I, I, it's been a really good time. I love talking about this stuff. I love helping other casters, even if you're not a caster, just a competitor who wants to put themselves in a better mindset and how to get around certain things. I love just being able to talk about this and maybe feel like I could help somebody in the process. Well, I'm already getting feedback from how fun this was, how much they enjoyed it. So you've definitely helped people in chat. Even if you haven't, you've helped me. So, I mean, I can tell you at least one person has received uh, some great advice here that they're going to apply today. So Thank you so much, Vicky, for taking the time out. As I mentioned before, this VOD will be up on YouTube, everybody. So if you did just come in, uh, we'll have it in its entirety posted there sometime in the next year. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a slow person when it comes to these things, but we will have it up there. I'll share it once it does go live so you can't miss it. But um, do you have any final thoughts, Vicky? Anything before we sign off? No, I can't wait to see more of your commentator speaker series, uh, Nine. I think this is an amazing idea, and thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you so much again for coming in. Thank you to everybody for watching. And until next time, everybody, stay fresh.